Let's move on to the big news of the week, the deteriorating relations between China and Australia. Ben, how would you describe that relationship between the two right now? Well, it's the worst uh, in living memory and we need to do something about it. Now, there's obviously fault on both sides. Uh, China is a brutal regime with a terrible human rights record. You don't need to tell people in uh, Tibet or Xinjiang uh, about that. Uh, and they also play their foreign affairs in aggressive and assertive manner. We've seen wolf warrior diplomacy. They're a growing big power that's going to assert its uh, might. And Australia has to learn how to deal with that. And Diplomacy is not always about who's right. It's about being diplomatic and getting the right response to get you the right uh, outcome over time. Uh, Australia has to face the fact that uh, China's a, a growing influential power and we need a strategy uh, to deal with it. Now, I, I think um, uh, Scott Morrison uh, got the tone wrong this week. He spoke too quickly and with emotion and it, Diplomacy needs something better. And that's not to say he shouldn't have spoken, uh, but I think to have held that press conference in the Lodge within 45 minutes of that tweet going up uh, and being angry and emotional about it probably got the wrong tone right and, and took uh, Beijing's bait. Australia needs a, a, a long-term diplomatic strategy to deal with China and it doesn't look like we've got one at the moment. Mm. Uh, we need a reinvestment in public diplomacy, uh, Australia's foreign aid and trade uh, and aid budget has been slipping. Only 1.3% of our budget is spent on foreign affairs and trade and aid and used to be 1.9%. It was 9% after the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, so big reinvestment in diplomacy befitting of a country the size and the scale of Australia. One last yeah. fact. Um, Chile, um, Greece, um, Portugal all spend much... have many more diplomatic posts than Australia does overseas despite having lower populations, only about 20% of Australia's GDP. Mm. As a mid-power, we can't... We're not, a, we're not a superpower, but we're not nothing. Yeah. We need a much more activist foreign policy uh, and, and a reimagining of our diplomacy. I guess that the hardest part in this diplomacy as well is that uh, China doesn't appear to be answering the phone. Australia says it's reached out many times and they're not getting uh, the phone call back. Uh, Renee, in terms of the strategy, like Ben mentioned just then, it, is it working to fix the problem with China? What needs to be done here? Well, I think that Scott Morrison's response um, was uh, completely reasonable and that Australia had the right to be angered by such an outrageous and offensive tweet. And that has been backed by the international community. And the international community is now, you know, hitting back on China. There seems to be a silly discussion that comes up with our relations with China every now and then about um, somehow a change in tone or nuance would fix the situation as if authoritarian regimes are really just after nicer words and tone. And I think any kind of argument around that should have been thrown out the window as soon as we saw the list of 14 grievances from China about Australia, because it effectively was a list of 14 things that China does not like about Australia being a free and democratic country. And anyone who wants to have this discussion about how a change in tone or how some nuance could fix this relationship, well, they need to get down to the brass tacks of it and look at this list of 14 grievances and say which of these they would be willing to sacrifice in order to please China. Would they be willing to sacrifice our free press to please China? Would they be willing to sacrifice the freedom of speech of our members of parliament? to please China, mm. because that is what this discussion comes down to in the end. And really, I don't think that China expects Australia to give in on any of these 14 grievances. It, in reality, this is a warning list to the rest of the world, to other countries, a list of foreign policies that if China sees them, they may punish economically. And we cannot give in to these kind of bullying ta tactics when it comes to an authoritarian regime like China. Yeah, and I guess it raises questions too about Australia's reliance on China moving forward. Um, let's move on now because Australia is planning to, uh, is dropping plans rather to use Kyoto credits to meet Paris climate targets. Uh, ben, this announcement is set to be made at a, a leaders summit next week. Is that the appropriate way forward, do you think? Yeah, w what a, a great decision it will be. And let's hope we get that uh, clear declaration from the Prime Minister on the 12th of the 
12th. Uh, we were meant to be having the next big international climate summit in Glasgow uh, this month, but it's been deferred by a year. And in a sense, this ambition summit uh, replaces that. And countries are asked to come along with new commitments because the climate crisis is getting worse. And uh, unless there's action, more action from all countries, including Australia, uh, the world is headed for climate catastrophe and the destruction of um, uh, species, um, habitats, um, uh, our economy, uh, our way of life in many places uh, within the lifetimes of many people watching. So unless uh, new action is taken at that climate summit and, and beyond, uh, uh, the world's going to be a very dangerous place. So good on Scott Morrison uh, for coming forward and cancelling those dodgy uh, Kyoto credits. There'll be time for criticism of, of Australia's other policies later on. We're gonna, all going to have to do a lot more at state and Commonwealth level in Australia and around the world. But uh, congratulations uh, to the Prime Minister uh, for, for dropping those dodgy credits, if that's what comes to pass at that Climate Ambition Summit. Renee, your thoughts on this? Is this to be applauded by Scott Morrison, as Ben said? I don't think so. I think Australia needs to be incredibly cautious right now about overly ambitious targets that will hamper the Australian economy, especially now of all times when, as we've already discussed, the Australian economy is at threat due to trade relations with China. The economy is already hurting because of COVID-19. I think the lines in the political sand are becoming incredibly clear in Australia, and it comes down to who is willing to sacrifice Australian jobs and Australian, the Australian economy to what is effectively virtue signalling because Australia will have no net impact on global temperatures and who is not willing to make that sacrifice and make us, uh, put Australia first. The coalition government, in my opinion, needs to make it very clear that they are on the side of jobs. Let's not forget that this coalition government miraculously won the election that was dubbed by the left as the climate election. So I think they need to be learning from the response from that and reflecting what the Australian people are really concerned about right now, which is the economy and jobs and not virtue signalling to global um, interests just to make ourselves feel good. Well, I guess as we head into the final uh, sitting week of Parliament, there'll be more on this. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Ben Oquist and Renee Gorman, great to chat. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Janika. Thanks, Renee. Thank you for having me.